everybody out tonight. Thank you for coming. And uh, as Brother Paul said, I've got about a 15-minute sermon that hopefully won't take any longer than about 45 minutes. <laughs> so this is the third um, episode in a series that I'm doing called The Truth of the Bible. And basically what it is, is it is a series that is going to help us to uh, validate the truth of the holy book that we hold so dear to us. Amen. So tonight we're going to be discussing Christ's earthly ministry through the, uh, the origin of it, the places and the events of his ministry, covering the entire three and a half years. And we're going to do it the same way we've been doing the other things that we've done so far, and that's through Old Testament prophecy and New Testament fulfillment of those prophecies. So one of the first things that we discover about Christ's ministry is that it will destroy the devil's work. Amen. In Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to Satan right after the fall of man, and he says this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The fulfillment of that's found actually in 1 John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And it was at the cross where Satan actually struck Jesus' heel, um, where he was crucified and died. But hallelujah, praise God, it was three days later at the resurrection where Jesus Christ crushed Satan's skull absolutely forever. We're told that he would be preceded by a forerunner. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In John 1, 23, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. We're told that his ministry would begin in Galilee. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The fulfillment in Matthew chapter 4 verses 16 and 17. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We also found out that Jesus would teach in parables. Now, a parable was just a story that Jesus made up on the spur of the moment, and it was given to whomever the audience was that he was addressing. And most of these parables would be understood by that audience because in the agrarian uh, society that they lived in, in the culture that they were in at that time, they would understand the basic story. The problem was most of the parables also had a spiritual and moral um, uh, part to them, which most of the folks did not get. Mm -hmm. Psalm 78, 1 and 2 says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. And Matthew 13, 34 says this, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude, in parables, and without a parable, spake he not unto them. But it also tells us in prophecy that all of his parables would fall on deaf ears. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says this, And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. 
And the fulfillment, again, of this prophecy is found in Matthew 13, 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. You know, Jesus also told his apostles that the parables that he shared would only be understood by those who were to inherit the kingdom of God. Those who weren't, it would just be like words. They would never get it. We're told in Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would be a stone that causes people to stumble. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 14 and 15 is the Old Testament prophecy, and it says, And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. And this was fulfilled by Jesus himself. First Peter 2, 7 through 9 says this, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Of course, Jesus was prophesied to have a sinless, blemish-free life and a ministry that would be taken from him by wicked men. A sinful, wicked man. Now, this was Jesus was the fulfillment of a type in the Old Testament, um, dealing with the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, because back there, um, lambs, bulls, uh, pigeons, sheep, whatever, when they were sacrificed, they had to be perfect, absolutely blemish-free, just like Jesus Christ was uh, our lamb. Amen. When he took the sin for all of us, he was God's lamb. Jeremiah eleven nineteen says, But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. Hebrews 9.14 says this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And also in Galatians chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Do you remember in the previous message where I talked about the covenant between God and the Son? Well, this basically is a verse that um, not just explains it, but verifies it. Amen. It says that Jesus would have a miraculous earthly ministry. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Now the fulfillment is found in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Now, Jesus himself would be despised and rejected by the very ones that he had come to save. Mm. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 and 4. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Luke 4, 28 and 29. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. That's just one. Did you know that in Scripture there are at least eight different times, and not places, but eight different times that we read about plots to murder Jesus? And here's some of them. Just if you want to write these down, you can. Luke 4, 16 through 30. And this was when he called out his hometown for their unbelief. Matthew 12, 1 through 14. Mark 2, 23 through Mark 3, 6. And Luke 6, 1 through 11. And this was to the Pharisees challenging their traditions concerning the Sabbath day. John 5, 1 through 18. This was when Jesus was claiming God as his own father. John 8, 48 through 59. And Jesus was using God's name, I am, as his own name. And they said, mm mm. So they plotted to kill him. John 10, 31 through 39. He actually referred to himself as God. This one, I had a little problem. I, I never knew this. John eleven forty five 45 through 57. And this was after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And they were upset. So I guess it didn't take much. Mark 11, 15 through 18. And Luke 19, 45 through 48. And this was when Jesus cleansed the temple, not only of the financial corruption, but also from the spiritual corruption in the temple. Matthew 21, 33 through 46, Mark 13, 1 through 12, and Luke 29 through 19. And this was after he told the chief priests and the Pharisees that the kingdom of God would be taken from them and given to another. Now, Jesus' response to all of this, and I found this very interesting. Now, you've got to remember, this was his response to his apostles. But this response also goes to every person who has faith in Christ, who follows Christ, and who is a servant of Christ. Just listen to this. It's found in John 15, verses 18 through 21. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep yours. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. So if you think that persecution is happening in the world today, we know that. Missionaries are being um, hunted down. We've got preachers in supposed civilized countries who are in jail now because they're preaching things that the Bible actually preaches or that the Bible teaches against, and they've been thrown into jail. So it's happening. And if you think for a second that persecution is not coming to the church, stand by. It's going to happen. It may not be happening right now today, but it's coming. Jesus was sent to preach, to heal, and to set the captives free. Amen. According to Isaiah 61.1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Luke 4, 20 and 21 says, And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And guess what scripture that was? 
that was Isaiah 61, 1. So let's do a little quick summation for all the stuff that we've learned so far through the first three of these, okay? Now the Old Testament is basically God's plan of salvation through the history of the nation of Israel to restore his entire creation back to himself. Now this was a promise that he made immediately after the fall in the Garden of Eden, back way back in Genesis. And he accomplishes this through a covenant, again, through he and his son, because his son leaves the glory of heaven. He is born an infant, grows up into adulthood, preaches the message of God's kingdom, and the restoration of that kingdom to the Father and to himself. He lives a completely sinless life in order to pay the sin debt that none of us has the ability to pay and that a righteous judge demands. Okay? Now there's a whole lot more about Jesus' earthly ministry that I could have put in here tonight, but time constraints just don't allow it. I'll give you an example, though. Remember the story about Jesus when he was 12 years old and they had come to Jerusalem for the Passover uh, I believe it was. And after two or three days of going back home, the parents noticed that he wasn't with them. So they circled back and they found him in the temple teaching the, uh, the, yeah, the, the uh, religious leaders there. And when they were questioning him about why he did what he did, what did he say to them? Did you not know that I would be about my father's business? So there was a lot more that I could have put in there, but I want to pray that this message has been a blessing and we're going to move into the last part of this next week. Um, so we'll be talking about God's reclamation project. That's us, Amen. you know, and the required payment for our sin, plus all the benefits of it through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Something that's kind of been on my mind here of late, and it just came to me, I don't know why, but I finally figured out I don't, you don't, Brother Paul, none of us save anyone. That's not my job. It's not any of our jobs. You know what our job actually is? Plant the seed. That's it. When you leave here, go out, talk to somebody. Your witness is the greatest um, thing that you have going for you. Amen. Talk to people. Amen. Do not be ashamed Amen. of the scripture. Don't be ashamed of your witness. Tell people what God's done for you. Amen. Live the life that shows Amen. God in your life. Love the Son. Anyway, um, that's pretty much it for tonight so until next time the lord bless you and bless thee and keep thee the lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace shalom go with the peace of god brother paul Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Okay.